Welcome to Discussions with the Writer Fred right here at Black Video Network in the hot San Antonio. As you all know, coming up real soon will be Juneteenth. Juneteenth was the day that black people in Texas were told they were free. So in keeping with that Juneteenth coming up, I have one of the experts on the subject of Juneteenth and on the subject of Texas politics, um, Professor Mario Salas. Mario's been a former city councilman, he's a professor, he's an author, and he's an activist. Mario, welcome to Discussions with the Writer Fred. Well, thank you for having me, Fred. I appreciate you and the work you're doing with this um, with Black Video News and all this stuff needs to be said, and I'm really glad you're doing that. Thank you. Okay. Let's still, tell us, reveal us a little bit about your book. Well, um, I'll just flash it on the screen, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. The uh, title of it is The Alamo, A Cradle of Lies, Slavery, and White Supremacy. And what the book does is uh, try to lay out from primary source documentation what really was going on during that period of time. What a lot of people don't understand is there was a lot of uh, piracy going on at that time. I mean, pirates, believe it or not, held a lot of power, especially along the Louisiana, Texas, Galveston coast, uh, because they were smuggling in slaves uh, after slavery, the importation of African slaves had been outlawed by the U.S. government. So right. what yeah. John Lafitte, everybody heard John Lafitte, the pirate, right? Yeah. He was smuggling in slaves illegally by pushing them over into Galveston, which was Mexico at the time, and then having people like Jim Bowie and, and William Travis purchase those slaves, bringing them into Texas, either from the Louisiana side or right out of Galveston Island. Mm. So these, these stories aren't told. <coughs> Excuse me, the fact that the Alamo defenders from the lowest private owned at least one slave. Oh, so okay. Crockett owned slaves. Really? Yeah, really. Crockett owned slaves, Bowie owned slaves, Travis owned slaves. The ones that were not even there, like Fannin, Burnett, Sam Houston owned about 14 slaves. The, these stories are not told, and obviously because they'd like to hide uh, the fact that people who had been designated heroes were actually anti-heroes, even if that. Um, and they firmly believed in white supremacy and firmly believed in slavery. So those, those are the kinds of things that, that are not told. Um, they're not, we aren't told about the, uh, the Underground Railroad to Mexico. Uh, blacks would often go to Mexico to escape slavery. Several of William Travis's slaves actually escaped um, from his clients. He was a lawyer by trade, um, and he, was, he filed lawsuits against Mexico trying to get the, the so-called property because mm -hmm. that's what black pe people were called in right. those days, yes. property, um, back from someone who had filed suit. He wasn't very successful at that because Mexico pretty much refused mm -hmm. um, to return escaped slaves to Texas or Louisiana slave owners. So you're telling my viewers that the, the, the great Davy Crockett, <laughs> we've had movies about how great and heroic Davy Crockett was, owned slaves? Yes, yes. Exactly. Before he left Tennessee, he was a slave owner. Uh, he had no uh, qualms about owning slaves. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the main reasons why many settlers came here was to get wealthy. And the American dream at the time, coming from a slave-owning state, was owning slaves. Now, if you were someone who wanted to buy slaves in, let's say, Tennessee, they cost quite a bit. Uh, and then to buy land was an added expense. If you came to Mexico, you could then sometimes get the land for free. At one point, it was six cents an acre, 12 cents an acre. So they could become almost wealthy overnight just by owning a few slaves. And then the land, they could buy for almost nothing and right. then get wealthy almost overnight. A lot of people don't know in the Constitution of 1836, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it was said that Texas could only buy their slaves from United States. And, and so you, you, yep. had a, you had this system going where you, you breed the slaves in North Carolina and South Carolina and Virginia, and you didn't ship them out here to Texas. Yeah, that, and that's right. And they, they had all kinds of little quirks in the Texas Constitution of 1836, and it, and it was done to completely undo uh, Mexico's position, anti-slavery posi right, position. Yes. Um, so they enshrined slavery. And, and the sad news is what most people don't know is that... Um, 
the, 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 and if you were not going, if you were a free black man or a free black woman, you had to leave Texas unless Congress, which was the Congress of Texas, right, yes. authorized that you could stay there. Well, I look at the list of the people that they authorized who could stay. Oh, boy, they got a secret history like you wouldn't believe. Uh -huh. Arnold, Samuel McCullough, Jr., they were mulattoes, number one. Okay. And I'm not knocking mulattoes. Look at me. I'm not, <laughs> knock, I'm not lo knocking the mulattoes, but I'm saying that one of their parents was white, and so they had a little bit better status. Right. Arnold, uh, I can't remember his first name. Arnold, I think it was his last name. He actually sold his own daughter into slavery. She oh. was darker than him. He sold his own daughter into slavery. Wow. She was, these so-called black Texas heroes, mm -hmm. they were slave owners. Oh, they were slave God. owners, <laughs> kind of like uh, black Creole slave owners in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. and that, and not a lot of them, but that's why Texas slave owners, the white Texas slave owners, supported them mm -hmm. because they supported slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've done a lot of uh, research on blacks in Mexico, haven't you, Mario? Yeah, quite a bit, because I have a relative uh, who was a Costa, what they call a Costa member. I look at my, my I had fun looking at my DNA on the ancestry uh -huh. dot com. I was able to trace a, I think a fifth grandfather to, well more than that, but a fifth grandfather um, back to 1700 who was black, black Afro Mexican, okay. uh, to the Costa system that Spain had set in place. Mm -hmm. And it says it on a birth certificate. They had two types of birth certificates, Fred. They had um, a, a birth certificate book basically it was the book of the whites. So if you were Spaniard, which meant, that doesn't make any sense, but if you were Spaniard at that time, that meant white. And okay. if you were mixed race or ethnicity, you were put in another birth certificate book called the book of the caste or castas, the okay. racial caste system. Oh. And that's what they mean by casta, okay. yeah. racial caste. So but, but Let's look at then um, June 19th, 1865. Uh, tell our viewers what, what that stands for, what happened uh, that day. Well, it, it, there, no one should have a problem with celebrating Juneteenth. It's an important day. Obviously, it, every important day has its shortcomings. On that day, <coughs> General Order Number 3 was delivered at Galveston Island by General Gordon Granger, Union officer. He was instructed to bring word of uh, emancipation for black people, um, which was done, what, two and a half years before that on the, under the emancipation uh, issued by Abraham Lincoln. So, it, you know, Texas is, is noted for everything, everything that comes here comes late, <laughs> <laughs> you know, including dancing. Yeah. You know, people were doing the Harlem Shuffle. We didn't start doing that until years after <laughs> nobody else doing the Harlem Shuffle. <laughs> so t everything in Texas would come down late, but there's a reason for that, and it has to do, obviously, with, with white supremacy. So they, because Texas was a slave-owning state, they tried to create a slave empire. They didn't want the word that blacks were free coming here in the first place. And then when it did, it had a lot of problems with it. Uh, <coughs> we should celebrate it for what it's worth, uh, because it did set in stone the fact that black people should be free. However, Gordon Granger was no real friend of black folks. Um, I'll tell you a couple of things he did in that general order, which most people don't even know about. Um, he, he in, in effect, worked with what's known as the Black Codes. The Black oh, Codes yes. were laws that were passed right after the Civil War from 1865 to 1867. Right. And those Black Codes still required that you have a pass when you're moving from one, let's say, plantation to another, or going into town to pick up supplies, you had to have a written pass from your master. Um, that was part of the Black Codes. Another part of the Black Codes was creating laws that kept blacks on the plantation, vagrancy law. You don't have a job or you don't have any means of support, you don't have a job. Um, then you could be charged with vagrancy, meaning you're just hanging around, you're just a bum, you ain't got a job, guess what, you, the judge would send you upon conviction, and which was not hard to do at the time, right. upon conviction, you'd be sent back to the very slave farm that you were a slave at and, and work for free. You, you wouldn't pay you. And so Gordon Granger, in effect, made these black codes part of general order number three. Hey, hold your point there. We're going to take a break. Yes. And we'll be right back and we continue to talk about the general 
and what he didn't do. Yeah, yeah. So discussion with writer Fred will be right back with our guest Mario Salas. Veterans, when you're struggling, soon becomes later, becomes someday, becomes when. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. Hello, this is Cornell with Frost Bank. Hi there, this is Terry with Frost. Good evening, this is Franklin. This is Robert with Frost. Hello, this is Rosemary with Frost Bank. Nothing to do this week? Don't miss another event. Go to blacksinsanantonio.com for our event calendar. The home of the largest business directory in San Antonio with an African American focus. Sign up today for our weekly e-blast and text message alerts. Help us make this a better community. Connect. Empower. Grow. Welcome back to Discussions with the Writer Fred, here with my guest, Mario Salas, who is an author, a scholar, an activist, a professor. Is there anything you don't do, Mario? Well, I was gardening this morning. Oh, gardener too. <laughs> <laughs> gardener too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to our conversation about General Granger. Okay. Well, <laughs> as, as we know, General Granger issued Order Number 3, which uh, brought the emancipation to Texas. Uh, but along with it, black codes, if you will. He brought with it vagrancy law. He brought with him, uh, blacks had to sign contracts with their existing plantation owner. And talk a little bit about the vagrancy law. Well, the vagrancy law is if you didn't have a job, um, you could be hauled before a judge. Uh, and it, all, it ma all it mattered, it amounted to was, if you were standing around or say traveling, looking for a job, from one, let's say, plantation to another, or from plantation to, to a town. Or looking for your family. Or looking for your family. Um, and the sheriff stopped you and said, where, where you work at? And he, well, I'm looking for a job. Well, you're under arrest. For what? It's against Texas law not to have a judge. So you'd be taken down, charged, arraigned before a judge, and sometimes the judge was the uncle of the sheriff that arrested you. <laughs> and you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, the judge would say, well, we have a law here in Texas. Uh, you, you have to have a job. You ain't got no job. That's $10 fine. You pay the $10, you can go ahead and leave. Well, I don't have a job. I, how am I going to pay $10? Right. Well, that's just too bad, ain't it? Uh, and they would make all kinds of ugly remarks. There's primary source documents that a judge might say things like, oh, why don't you contact Mr. Lincoln? Oh, I'm sorry, we killed him. Oh. Uh, the fine is $10, so you're going back to the plantation uh, to work off your debt. So it's called debt peonage or okay. debt convict labor or whatever the uh -huh. case may be. So they would send you back to the very plantation that you were a slave at to be enslaved by another name. Slavery by another name. Mm -hmm. So There was a book by that title, wasn't there? There was a movie and a book. book yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Slavery by another name. And that's what the vagrancy laws actually did. They kept slavery going on because of the wording of the 13th Amendment, which said slavery is illegal except, that's the big word, yeah. for punishment for a crime. Right. Okay, so what's punishment for a crime? You can't pay vagrancy, you can't pay the $10, so now right. they can send you back to slavery. Mm. How long did that go on, Mario? Uh, well, the diff if you talk, depends on which historian you talk to. Some say it went all the way on to the 1960s. Others say it pretty much was over by 50, mm -hmm. 1950, so it was a long time right, that yeah. they, they kept using it uh, to send people to coal mines in Alabama or to plantations in Texas. So it was only in Texas, it was throughout the southern. It was throughout the southern, former slave owning states. Yeah. Do you think one of the problems was that Lincoln was assassinated and we got Johnson, who was from Tennessee, oh, as yes. the president? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And there's some historical uh, evidence to suggest that Johnson may have been in on the plot to kill Lincoln, along with Jefferson Davis. Oh, really? some, yes, there are some historians. There's, uh, there's a few uh, Smithsonian uh, shows that come on on the Smithsonian Channel that talk about the possibility that Jefferson Davis played a role in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. 
Well, I'm Jeff Davis, and some of these other people were closely connected to each other because of politics, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's some evidence to at least suggest that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you mentioned earlier in our discussion, or during our break, a book by uh, Mr. Smallwood called Time of Hope, Time of Despair yes. that discusses this whole period. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, it, it, it's a good title because obviously Juneteenth and any uh, efforts to eliminate slavery or even reconstruction uh, period that took place was a time of hope. It was, it was a time to have hope to that uh, some of this racism, white supremacy, hatred would eventually be diminished to go away, uh, but it didn't. So it was also a time of despair. In his book, he talked about uh, how in Texas they um, didn't want blacks to, to, to do too much of anything. So several things happened. When Granger issued his order, General Order Number 3, Smallwood points out that in some cases blacks were threatened that if they tried to leave the plantation, they would be killed. Mm -hmm. um, the slave owner would pull out a shotgun and his men and say, just try to leave. We don't care what the general said, you ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So they sabotaged the general order number three. In other plantations, it's weird in a way, Fred, they sabotaged it in the opposite direction. The slave owner would say, oh, you, you, you want to be free? Well, you just get off my property before I kill you. So, they would, so these thousands of blacks sometimes would be on the road, just like refugees coming out of Syria, like we would see in the yeah, news now. Yeah, definitely. Thousands of blacks on yeah. the road with nowhere to go. And no money. No money, no food, no job, nothing. Yeah. Uh, still they survived, but nothing. Um, and so this is the bad part about Juneteenth and General Gordon's uh, order number three. So it's a good, I guess you could say the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. uh, associated with that. Doesn't mean we shouldn't celebrate, we, should, we, have, to celebrate. we have to celebrate. Because the word of it is, it did change some things. Some slave owners were afraid of those Union soldiers because yeah. they, they would go to that plantation and say, you go make them work, but you're gonna have to pay them. Uh -huh. so, that, yeah. so some of them would give up, say, okay, well, whatever. We change, we'll have to change with the system, so they changed. Others refused to change. You know, just think about that. Here were here four million blacks out there, no one gave them money, man. No one gave them anything. It's horrible, man. And they survived. Yep. I mean, that, that's something we should be proud of. Yeah, we should, that's right. We should really that, love for that no other reason. That's a good that reason. They survived. To celebrate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's hard. I don't know. I don't know anybody today might make that. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> um, yeah. that, that's a, that's a hard road to tow. I mean, you, you literally sometimes living off the land, you know, trying to find a lizard to eat. Anything. You know, kill a pig, a wild pig, or something. Chitlins became a, a delicacy. You know, Black-eyed black -eyed peas, Black-eyed peas, yeah. yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So, so, but yeah, it speaks, uh, I think, a wonderful story of people who want to survive and are gonna survive no matter what they try to do to them. To them. And I just don't think we give them, I mean, I have no problem going all the way back to Africa. Uh, to, to, but sometimes we bypass that period yeah. and, and overlook what they did. We don't give them the credit that they deserve. They really do need to Man, give They them. went up that rough side of that mountain, <laughs> you know, yeah. that rough side of that mountain yeah. and made it. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, that, that story is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. but, but in that book, uh, Smallwood also points out that um, God, they would hunt down blacks for the any black, one, one guy, he was a racist in East Texas. Mm -hmm. East Texas was the worst place. East Texas is like Mississippi uh, during that time, and still is. To some, yeah, still really, is. I was gonna say. Um, But he, he, this guy, he called himself Dixie. He, he was quoted in one of the East Texas newspapers. Uh, I, I, I enjoy killing Indians, but I prefer to kill free black men. And, uh, and he offered um, to kill any free black man that you might point out to him for a dollar and 50 cents. For a dollar fifty cents. Yeah, and we started off at seventy-five cents. Uh -huh. I'll kill any free black man for seventy-five cents. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a break, but I'm I'm going to try to touch on what's going to be a very controversial subject. Um, and I understand that some came out of the Union Army and became Buffalo soldiers. Oh yeah. But, uh, I want to discuss that briefly. Well, let's do, let's do it, Fred. Okay. 
uh, we'll be right back with discussion with the writer Fred with my guest, Mario Salas. Thank you. 2021 is complete. Good or bad, you made it through. The year of many firsts. It will not be easily forgotten. The Black Book Yearbook will help you capsule the year that was 2021. Own your part of history. Get your yearbook today at blacksinsanantonio.com. For the latest news and community activities, visit our companion site, blackvideonews.com. Celebrating over 10 years of documenting the community. My Shiro doesn't always wear a cape, but she always has time for a hug, a smile, for going the extra mile. My Shiro stretches every dollar, puts in long hours, puts others first. But now it's your time, Mom. When you're ready to retire, we want you to be able to enjoy it. It's time to start saving now. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. Visit aceyourretirement.org slash Shiro. Right here with Professor Mario Salas, professor, author, gardener now, huh? Gardener now. Yeah, and I have a telescope on my back porch. A telescope, uh, yeah, too. Yeah, and I've been waiting to use it. Uh, the sky's been pretty clear. I might get to it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a Renaissance band. Yeah, I don't, yeah we're yeah, right here. Yeah. Uh, well, right after uh, Emancipation Proclamation, I think that's when the whole um, the Buffalo Soldiers came into right. existence. And right. I, I have, yeah, I don't want to be too critical of those men yeah. because of the times, but. Like you were mentioning this this racist who said, I'll kill any black for a dollar fifty. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't the Buffalo soldiers have been killing him instead of the Native Americans? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm this is an interesting subject because that's another story that's not there's a piece of that story that's not told. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't you know, African American troops that were used in the Civil War to fight for their freedom. That was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Fight for their freedom. Of course they weren't treated very well even in the Union Army. But they, they did make the difference between victory and, and, and losing. The, the, black the, soldiers is, the black soldiers is what won the Civil War. Really? Changed the tide of the Civil War. Um, and Lincoln did admit that, that they changed the tide. Lincoln probably wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for Fred Douglas. Fred Douglas pushing, pushing Lincoln, you've got to get these black guys. They have to fight. Uh -huh. They want to fight. Right. They have to fight. And, and Lincoln finally did it. But after the Civil War, after um, slavery is officially abolished, they mm -hmm. then began to concentrate on another one of their enemies. And I, when I say their enemies, I mean the in, white society's enemies. And those enemies were Native Americans. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so you had the Indian Wars that heated up right after the Civil War. Uh, you, had, you had Custer, who was a Union soldier, yeah, he was one of, the main, last yeah, stand. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> one of the main killers of Native Americans. Uh, General Sheridan, um, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That was Sheridan that came up with that comment. Mm. Um, Sherman, uh, Tecumseh Sherman, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, he was also uh, hated Indians too, uh, Native people too. Um, and so the, the people that were readily available to do this, you know, they used, in every war blacks were used as you might call cannon fodder. You know, use them to kill other people mm -hmm. that may be fighting for their freedom. Um, so they used black buffalo soldiers to kill Native Americans. That, that, that's the ugly part, and I agree 100%, that's not good. Um, on the other hand, and you had made a good point about you understand the times, black people were trying to get some kind of recognition to be honored some kind of way, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, the pathway to that was dictated by the white supremacists. Yeah. So when they're dictating the pathway to integrity and honor, then sometimes you're left with, that's the only way I'm going to get it. Mm -hmm. And then you don't even get it. Then they didn't get the, the integrity right. and yeah. the honor. But what's not told, Fred, is there was many Buffalo soldiers who deserted the Buffalo yeah, soldiers. Yeah, I was hoping you would talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they joined the very Native American tribes they were assigned to kill. Okay. Uh, a lot of blacks joined the Creek, joined Cherokee tribes, joined Comanche tribes, joined this tribe and the other tribe, especially over in, in West Texas near the, near the Mexican border mm -hmm. where there were a lot of Comanche, Kickapoo, some of those Native American tribes. Right. They, they deserted, they absolutely refused to fight 
um, for that. And then in later times, after the Indian Wars are over around 1882 roughly, um, the, the uh, blacks would actually join Pancho Villa in the war oh. against General Sherman. Oh, really? Yeah, one black man, we, we, Gen, uh, Professor Gerald Horn, you probably heard of him, he actually found the, the name of some of them. One, his name was William Ryan, a black buffalo soldier under the command of General Pershing, Black Jack Pershing. Of course, he was called the N-word Pershing before it was Black Jack. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he was under the command of Pershing. He had a small town. They were chasing Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa, they never caught him, but they were chasing him. And these black buffalo soldiers deserted on the spot in the middle of a battle, went to Pancho Villa's side with a 50 caliber machine gun that William Ryan carried uh -huh. across one trench, because it was like trench fighting. Uh -huh. One trench to the other and opened fire on his own men. Uh -huh. <laughs> this black buffalo soldier became a colonel in Pancho Villa's army. Oh, wow. <laughs> William, William Ryan. Don't forget the name. That, that's the stories we don't hear. You don't hear those stories. Before we close out, I'd like to talk about... I, I know I was on Capitol Hill trying, working, trying to get Martin Luther King's birthday as a national holiday. We, we ran into all kinds of problems. It oh, took yeah. us five years. Why do you think it was so easy to get Juneteenth as a national holiday. I think they were between a rock and a hard place. Um, some, sometimes, you know, when you live in a system that's racialized, a system that's been governed by white supremacy for I don't know how long, they realize that there's going to be a struggle against them trying to prevent something that's positive for black people. Okay. So rather than put up a fight, let's develop a pathway to make it happen mm -hmm. and then what we have to watch out now for is that they will corrupt it somehow somehow uh -huh. by well let's talk about the blacks who fought for the confederacy and let's honor them on juneteenth too. oh okay so, yeah. so i'm looking i'm looking thing. that that's going somebody's going to make that attempt mm -hmm. sooner yeah. or later yeah. because they don't do anything for free they they always want to try to either corrupt it co-opt it yeah. co-opt it probably the best word yeah. for it and, and, and so I, I think they did it because they were between a rock and a hard place. How could they say no and have some form of legitimacy to claiming, you know, we're the, we're the great democratic country, you right. know, we're moving against racism. How could they say no, mm. you know, to the rest of the world, but by the same token, they're not going to want it to go full speed ahead. So you, you, I think we'll see, we're probably already seeing in some See places. what's going to happen? Yeah. So it's been 157 years since um, been a uh, while wow what yeah. kind of progress how do you measure the progress <coughs> excuse I, me how, how do you look at those 157 years as to where we are now in 2022 well you know it, it's a it's a rough road to understand because there obviously has been progress there obviously has been progress but when and I, I want to use that term again when you look at how it sometimes is corrupted or co-opted, mm -hmm. there's always this attempt to turn the clock back on the progress. So we made, we had a 64 Civil Rights Act, um, outlawed segregation, supposedly. We had a 65 Voting Rights Act right. that supposedly gave us voting rights, right. but now, we have, to take away. now yeah. we have voter suppression. Yeah. So what, what, what we always have to look at it, an advancement in terms of, okay, now what are they gonna try and take away? Next. So we need to look at all of our advancements as a stepping stone that they're going to try to take away, and we have to reinforce that stepping stone to try to prevent them from taking it back. Yeah. Um, kind of like when Obama got elected, we were all happy. We all, everyone was, slapping each other, high-fiving. And it didn't take them long for, to, to try and reverse around. everything he's done. Yeah. So they're not good. They don't go to sleep like some of us do. All <laughs> they, they don't never go to sleep yeah. Yeah. because... They view everything as an attack against white supremacy. Every, oh, every, okay. All black progress is looked to them, is looked at as an attack against, against them. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 The way I see it. So do you feel, final question, do you feel, I, I hear some people arguing that integration was not good. Where do you come down on that? Well, I'm, I'm kind of in between. Um, you could make the argument that during segregation that there was pockets 
of black entrepreneurship in which blacks were able to control the, econo the, the economics of their community because they were forced to. Yeah. It wasn't that they necessarily wanted to, but yeah, they forced were forced to. to. Yeah. So they, like we talked about earlier, yeah. well, no food, no, no clothes, no nothing, right. but making something out of nothing. That's the very positive part. And it did create a sense of community and cohesion that disappeared to some degree, not completely, but disagreed to some degree, disappeared to some degree because, because of integration. Now, on the other hand, there's no doubt about it, segregation is a crime. It's a crime yeah. uh, to huh. try and tell people, you can't go to this white school, you can't sell these, your products to a white customer. Right. That's a crime against humanity. Yeah. So you can't say segregation was a good thing. It was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. So, but black people were able to take a horrible thing and make something workable out of it. Right. Today, I do run into black doctors, black professionals all the time, who, who they have another twist on it. They, they agree with that, basically what I just said, but they make this comment. One black doctor, a podiatrist, and a friend of mine, he told me, all of my customers are white. Uh -huh. And he okay. said, during segregation, that wouldn't be that possible. Wouldn't happen, yeah. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna attack integration like some people do, because there is a benefit to it. I, I'm wealthy because now I can service anybody's feet whether right, the feet yeah. are black or white. Yeah. So, so he said, so I, you gotta be careful with that. It's a mixed bag. It's probably a mixed story. It's a two-way street. Okay. You wanna tell our viewers one more time how they can get your book okay. before we close out? Well, I'm, I'm doing book signings around town. I have, I'll announce another one at some point, but you can order it uh, straight from Cynthia, which is right there on the back, S-E-N-T-I-A, Cynthia Publishing, at www.cynthiapublishing.com. Um, forward slash Alamo, or you can just give me a, a call, 210-454-3875. Okay. So if I'm a New Yorker and I want to get it, can I go to Amazon? You can go to Amazon. Amazon. It's available on Amazon as okay. well. Okay. Well, Mario, I want to thank you for being our guest here on Discussion with Writer Fred. I think it's very informative. You brought up some great information, and I hope my viewers took all this in and got something from it. Well, I thank want to you. thank you. Well, thank you, Fred. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. This is Discussion with Writer Fred telling our story our way.